Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Hey guys, welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. Today, Brian is actually not here, and I have the wonderful Dr. Jason Fung, and also joining us is Dr. Doug Gwynn. And uh, you guys all know, obviously, who Dr. Jason Fung is, so he doesn't need any more introduction than that. Um, but I'd like to tell you a little bit about Dr. Doug Gwynn, who's joining us and is going to talk about his story. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we have uh, Dr. Fung only for the first half of this, uh, so you're going to hear his insights on a very important topic, chronic kidney disease and some other issues, um, and then we'll hear more about Dr. Doug. And the reason why we have Dr. Doug here is because his life was completely changed by Dr. Jason Fung. And, um, you know, uh, Dr. Doug, very happy to have you here. Thank you. And. Uh, with yeah, my so, heroes. so so one of the interesting things is, is I know you did your, uh, uh, you went to a liberal arts school, you ended up going to uh, University of Missouri for your medical school, you went to Wichita for your family medicine, family medicine um, uh, training, and then you did an OB fellowship again at Wichita, and then you've practiced for essentially 35 years until you retired, and um we had just talked about this, uh, I know, in our group call, and we've talked uh, offline, but you found yourself with hypertension, you know, metabolic syndrome, high triglycerides, chronic kidney disease, and just to give everybody some, some idea, you know, his, his, uh, you know, his kidneys were basically functioning about half of what they should have been. And then you heard uh, Jason Fung talk. And you implemented uh, low carb eating, some intermittent fasting, and even gone keto carnivore, and your kidney function is just basically doubled. So we, so is that about? Did I get it about right? Yeah, you did. Yeah. I so actually, the, I actually started uh, before I knew about Jason Fung. I'd already started keto, so um, uh, I think that's where my my kidney started improving. And then, uh, you know, then obviously I've added in inter intermittent fasting. And the reason I became carnivore, which I think, which is important uh, because we need to talk about protein in the kidney and protein intake. Um, I went keto, I went uh, carnivore because I had significant arthritis in my neck and back, significant pain. I couldn't take NSAIDs like ibuprofen or uh, Aleve, because, uh, naproxen, because of my kidneys and their del deleterious effect on the kidney. And when I saw the nephrologist, when my GFR was down at 48, uh, she basically said, probably I had it because of the NSAIDs I'd taken for my back. And also because I had been hypertensive since age 40, even though it was well controlled. So uh, the reason I went carnivore is because I couldn't get rid of my back pain completely, although it was better with keto. And after three weeks of carnivore, my back pain disappeared. So and, and so I've stuck with that. So and you know that same nephrologist we've talked offline about this. Didn't she tell you you're probably going to have to think about limiting protein? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So so. Doctor, I'm going to pivot to Dr. Fung. So Dr. Fung, you hear this. I'm sure you hear it all the time. Doctor after doctor that I've met has said that you've changed your life. I remember going to Obesity Week two years ago. Wow, it's, it's been two years. Meeting doctor after doctor who said um, that you've changed your life. So now you get to hear another doctor whose life you've changed. And this is somebody who had 35 years of training, you know, was, was an expert in family medicine. So, um, and he sees another expert, a nephrologist, who rightly takes him off some medications, but says, you better think about limiting protein. So I'm just curious, what do you think when you hear that message? Uh, it's a very common message, actually. Um, and um, it's really not true. I mean, the, the, the where it comes from is this belief from about 25 years ago, where we thought that kidneys would put a lot of pressure on your 
sorry, protein would put a lot of pressure on your kidneys. And the idea is that uh, when you take all these amino acids, um, you have to sort of metabolize them and you excrete them as nitrogenous waste. Um, so uh, amino acids have a lot of nitrogen. So the kidneys get rid of this nitrogen as ammonia. There's, uh, if, especially if you eat animal proteins, then there's often an acid load associated with them. So not so much with vegetable proteins, but again, you're gonna have to acidify the urine and therefore the kidneys are gonna have to work harder. And that was the idea. So you're making the kidneys work harder and therefore you're going to have them break down. So this was an idea that was very popular about 25 years ago. We, um, in the chronic kidney disease uh, literature, we had a very, very large study, the MDRD study, which basically looked at this and they said, well, does eating a low protein diet uh, reduce or slow the progression of chronic kidney disease? And we all believed it was true because this was back when I was doing training. Um, so we did it anyway, even before the <laughs> evidence was available. When the evidence came out, of course, there's no evidence that limiting protein was actually a good thing to slow kidney disease. So it didn't make any difference. Um, when they looked at various dietary studies and so on, looking at whether high protein diets cause people without kidney disease to get kidney disease, same thing, you couldn't really find any evidence that it was true sort of whatsoever. And the idea sort of went out the window because even in the people with chronic kidney disease, what was the much bigger problem? Uh, so one, it, if you have chronic kidney disease, it didn't slow the rate of chronic kidney disease, but then what you'd start to see is basically some people who would have low albumins, low protein rates, you know, um, muscle loss, sarcopenia, that kind of thing. When people were just, you know, slashing their protein down to zero, it wasn't a good thing because people need protein. So in fact, in, in people with kidney disease and in, in people on dialysis, we're telling them to eat protein. So, you know, it's, it's sort of ridiculous to think that this is going to be uh, really bad for your kidneys when nephrologists are telling their worst kidney patients, oh, you need to make sure you eat enough protein. Um, to trickle through. And that was, that was where it all came from. So when keto became very popular and keeping in mind that keto is not a high protein diet, um, it's sort of a high fat diet, which was the big difference uh, with, with a lot of the low carb diets of the past. Uh, a lot of people sort of um, latched onto this really old belief from a long time ago that it would work. And, and it makes no sense. If you have normal kidneys, then they should be able to excrete the, the nitrogenous waste product and, uh, you know, acidify the urine to get rid of the acid load. Uh, there should be really no issue with that. I mean, in what uh, you know, system, do we say, well, using it too much is, is like, you know, not too extreme, but is, is bad. Like if you use your muscles a lot, do you get really weak? It's like, no, you get stronger. Like it doesn't even make any sense because this is not um, something that's sort of unphysiologic. We're eating protein because, you know, people eat protein. That's, that's what it is. It's, it's not like you're eating 100% protein for, for years and years and years. So this whole idea that protein causes kidney disease, it was a very old belief. It's been, you know, for people who deal with kidney disease, we haven't done that in, in decades, probably. It's been a long time. And yet in the lay press, you hear this from from, from doctors when they want to find some reason to say you should have, you know, you should avoid, pro, you know, the keto diet or whatever. Uh, you know, it's one of these reflexes. Hey, we used to say that it was bad for the kidneys. So let's drag that old chestnut back out here and throw it back on. But yeah, there's no real evidence that that, that is true. There's actually good evidence that people with kidney, without kidney disease do not develop kidney disease when they eat a high protein diet. I've seen some pretty good studies with, uh, you know, bodybuilders uh, given protein supplementation for years at high doses with no ill effects on kidneys, with no bone loss, which is like the other fear, I guess. So, you know, I, at least in healthy people, you know, but, but I wonder, and maybe you can help me understand this because, you know, in your book, um, 
which I absolutely love, by the way, the cancer code. Uh, you talk a lot about how cancer could be related to, um, you know, just say, let's just say related to lifestyle choices, right? I mean, the, even the American Cancer Society says that uh, 60 to 80% of cancer is pre potentially preventable by lifestyle choices, smoking, diet, exercise. Um, how much of chronic kidney disease do you think is directly attributable to lifestyle choices? If I had to guess, you know, I would say, you know, hypertension and diabetes are probably the largest offenders and those are certainly treatable through lifestyle. So yeah. what, what do you say to that? It's, it's, it's very high. So I'm, I mean, you're looking at probably like upwards of 70% because di ty you're, you're absolutely right. So hypertension, type two diabetes. Now, not all hypertension is diet related. There is, uh, especially in, um, in the, in, you know, in, in the America, anyway, I used to work in Los Angeles where we have a lot of African-Americans and there's a lot of salt sensitive hypertension there. And that, that might be, there's a different reason for that. So um, blacks are much more prone to get hypertension and for that hypertension, they're much more prone to develop kidney disease. So there's a genetic component to that. And many of them, especially the ones I saw years and years ago, it, the hypertension was, was completely different than, than, than the stuff we, you know, the, the stuff that was affecting other people. It was more severe. It was caused more problems. Um, but for most people, hypertension and type 2 diabetes, that's going to be the majority of kidney disease. Um, after that, you've got like very, relatively rare causes like polycystic kidney disease is probably the more, one of the more common IgA nephritis, but they're not that common overall. They're like a 5%, uh, you know, 7%, that sort of thing. So since, since type two diabetes and hypertension make up the bulk of kidney disease, really both of them are related to, um, to dietary and lifestyle uh, things. I mean, when you take a, a, a sort of more, uh, a bigger look at it, and, and Doug was mentioning this, if you look at metabolic syndrome, it encompasses both hypertension and uh, increased blood sugars, um, but it also includes a couple of other things, which is of course the waist circumference and the HDL and triglycerides. So the interesting thing about metabolic syndrome, of course, is that you can link all of those back to hyperinsulinemia. When you have sort of high levels of insulin, you tend to gain weight, your blood sugars tends to go up, your blood pressure tends to go up, and your triglycerides when you're eating, say, a very high carbohydrate diet. And this has been very well known for a long time. If you eat a very high carbohydrate diet, your LDL, of course, might be stable or come down a bit, sort of low fat, high carb diet, but your triglycerides goes way up and your HDL goes way down, which is always interesting to me because we obsess about LDL and LDL is nowhere in the definition of metabolic syndrome. It's triglycerides and HDL, which everybody knows that you eat, you know, 60% carbohydrates, especially the refined stuff, your triglycerides goes up like that's sort of common knowledge. So we know that those high carbohydrate diets are going to cause your weight to go up for a lot of people, your blood sugars to go up because if you can just look at something so simple like the glycemic index. So you've got your, your triglycerides, your HDL, your weight, your sugars, and your blood pressure. Because again, insulin is going to cause uh, salt and water retention at the level of the proximal tubule you get water retention, it's like an anti-diuretic, so it's going to make your blood pressure go up. So, you know, and this, we give diuretics as antihypertensives. So therefore, you've got this diet that we've been telling people to follow, which is high carbs, lots and lots of carbs, very, very low fat. And yet we know from a physiologic standpoint that the carbs, which leads to the hyperinsulinemia, when you're eating one, lots of carbs, and two, eating all the time because those carbs aren't keeping you full, is going to contribute physiologically, pathophysiologically, to all five of those measures of metabolic syndrome. And it's like, well, duh, since kidney disease is, the majority is caused by metabolic syndrome, that's how you get into the state where even doctors don't know that because, you know, nobody ever says like that, that, you know, even doctors don't know, hey, 
if you're eating lots of carbs and you're shooting your insulin up, then you're going to worsen all five measures of that metabolic syndrome. And therefore your kidneys, which is mostly related, kidney disease is mostly related to metabolic syndrome, is going to make it worse. And that's, that's a crazy, crazy thing that it's like, a, it's so obvious when you look at it, but yet nobody knows. It's crazy to think that. Because I think, you know, I, I think the problem with doctors is they, they see, uh, so I think very reliably in the medical literature, low-fat diets actually, even if you lose weight, will, uh, you know, in the weight loss data literature, even in meta-analyses, it lowers HDL slightly and increases triglycerides slightly, and it lowers LDL, uh, just as you'd expect. So even if you look in the weight loss data, there's some of this evidence right there. But I think what most standard clinicians do is they just say, well, you have to maintain your weight and you have to lose weight. So like, yeah, we know that it causes metabolic syndrome, but you have to work on these other components. And they rely on portion control and, you know, weight maintenance as a necessity, you know, a necessary factor of this idea that low fat would ever work, which, I mean, we've failed that. You know, we failed that model. I think we've shown that. I want to ask one other question. I know, Dr. Doug, I see you there, but I want to ask one other question because um, we have actually in the audience right now, I'm, I'm looking probably about five to six healthcare professionals. And, um, and before you go, I want to ask you this question because I really need a, both a you know, lifestyle expert and a nephrologist expert. Let's say you have somebody just like Dr. Doug and or, you know, uh, who's lowered their insulin level, okay, lowered their, uh, their weight has come down um, and, they're, and they've eaten, you know, they're, they're, you know they, you got them on a CGM and their blood sugar stable, you know, that metabolic syndrome is starting to reverse and they still have a high blood pressure. You know, what are you thinking as a clinician? I'm just curious, like what's going on through your mind? What are the things that you look for? You know, is there any low hanging fruit there? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's hypertension is much less uh, reliably brought down with a low carbohydrate diet uh, than sugars, for example. So um, there's lots of different things. But the other problem, of course, is that when you have it for a long time, what happens is that you get this arteriosclerosis. So it's like a tube, like if you think about a flexible rubber tube, and you subject it to very high pressure, then you get sort of stiffening. Like you think about a rubber hose or like a garden hose or something, you expose it to extreme pressure and temperature, it gets stiff. And when it gets stiff, of course, it's supposed to be soft and you know compliant. And it's just like the, the, the blood vessels. Instead of being nice and soft and compliant rubber, it's sort of stiff. And when it's stiff, the problem is that as you fill up that tube, the pressure goes up very, very quickly because you don't have that, that, that nice, uh, you know, compliance. And this is the same thing that happens within a um, uh, blood vessel. So when you have high blood pressure over many, many years, you get this arteriosclerosis. So the, the, uh, the artery actually develops increasing stiffness in order to sort of counteract that high pressure. It needs to get thicker in order for it not to burst. So as it gets thicker and it's developed sclerosis, it's going to get harder and, and, and the stiffness actually makes the pressure worse in the long term. So the, the, the bottom line is that if you have it for a long time, it doesn't come down so easily because it takes a long time for that stiffness to go away. So that arteriosclerosis, it, it, it can come down quickly if it's relatively soon, but if you have like 10, 15 years of high blood pressure, that stiffness doesn't always come down so quickly. The, so one of the things that you see in, in, in studies of blood pressure, for example, and, it, it, and this, is, this used to be 20 years ago when you used to say normal blood pressure. I, I don't know if you remember this show, but Doug, you probably will. Uh, remember people used to say, uh, normal blood pressure was 100 plus age. So we had these 70 year olds walking around with blood pressures of a, 170 and we'd say it was normal. This is when I just started practice. It was insane. 
<laughs> like we'd have people walking around at 180, 80 year olds with 180. And we'd say, oh, that's normal. You don't need blood pressure pills. And in the early nineties, there were these trials that of course showed that it would come down. So the problem was that we let people back then and that's where we got good data. When you leave them walking around with high, high pressures, it doesn't come down. So therefore it doesn't come down as reliably. When you treat patients clinically, uh, you see the blood sugars can come down very quickly. Um, fatty liver too is one of these diseases that responds incredibly well. So, you know, the ASTs, the ALTs, when they follow that low carb diet, when they do the intermittent fasting, that, that fatty liver just comes right down. I, I consider it along with the, 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 the sugars, one of the easiest things to treat, but blood pressure is not, it doesn't, it doesn't always fall right away. So you could be doing everything right but it can take time in order for you to get the, the pressures to slowly come down. But the good thing is that when you do get it down and it may take medications to bring it down, then you're going to keep it soft and compliant. There's a study talking about treating prehypertension. They did this about five or six, eh, it's probably about 10 years ago. They looked at treating prehypertensives and they found that you, you wound up getting a lot less hypertension down the line because again, you're not subjecting the, the, the blood vessel to those uh, increased pressures and therefore you get less of this arteriosclerosis in the end. So, you know, it's, it's not always like you're not, it doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong if that blood pressure doesn't come down. It certainly may because you may get the diuretic effect of, of low carb, you may get the, with the fasting and so on, but it can also take some time as well. Yeah, I, I dropped I, from three. I dropped from three blood pressure meds to now taking one. Oh, that's amazing! Actually, I see that a lot too, but it's not um, it's not as consistent. Uh, like when I see, when I look at somebody with the blood, uh, and we and we do have like 20, 30 percent of people who do very well, but uh, the sugars almost always do well. The, the 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 liver enzymes, if they have fatty liver, almost always do well, and the blood pressure is sort of iffy. I'm always happy when it happens, and the the kidney function is even less uh, common because again, it's also one of these long chronic things. So you get this chronic nephrosclerosis, which is not always reversible. You get it early enough, it's great. You can, you can get it a lot better and I'm always super happy, but it's less reliably. I, I find it less reliable than the other, but certainly with the hypertension, it's, it's clearly related to the hyperinsulinemia. Dr. Doug, do you want to ask him any parting questions? I know, uh, 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 Jason, you have to head out, but any parting questions for Jason before he heads out? Yeah. So, um, is it still considered true that, uh, kidney function goes down with age? You know, I was taught that starting at age 40, uh, every decade, it went down about 10 cc's, uh, a minute. And, uh, so, uh, we know from the CDC statistics in 2019 that 38% of those over 65 have chronic kidney disease. So uh, my question is, is uh, this really an age-related thing or is it that um, sort of like um, with blood sugar that there's so many people uh, out there that are not healthy that we're seeing the chronic kidney disease with age not really being an age-related phenomenon, but due to the lifestyle? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's always hard to tell because these really long studies and large prevalence studies of aging, you really just have to, like you can't do it in a randomized manner. You just sort of take averages and see what happens. It's like blood pressure. If you look at blood pressure over time, um, it goes way up as you get older. So, you know, 50 year old versus an 80 year old, your risk of hypertension is much higher at 80, but that's actually not true in a lot of sort of, uh, societies that eat traditionally. So you look at, uh, these natives and stuff, uh, sort of whether it's native uh, people in South America, for example, they, they study these tribes in Brazil that are eating as they were they don't get that hypertension with age. Whereas every time you look at a westernized society, you do. And so you see the same thing with uh, kidney disease in that you see that the kidney function is declining with age, but the, you can't tell because all you're doing is you're taking snapshots of the population at, you know, so in, 
you know, at this time you say, okay, let's look at the 50 year olds, the 60 year olds, the 70 year olds and 80 year olds. And you can see that the, the kidney function is clearly declining uh, over age, but is that, and, and you see the same thing with hypertension, you see that the blood pressure is clearly going up with age, but is that really due to the way that we live in, or is it, is it, is it part of natural physiology? My guess is that you are correct that this is not part of natural aging, but none of us probably are able to go back to that sort of natural state where we're sort of living without any kind of, um, you know, modern conveniences and we're all eating sort of modern factory farms and factory foods and stuff. It's, it's almost impossible to get away from that. If you do live sort of hunting and gathering, and there's still very few populations in the world that do that now, uh, my guess is that you're not going to see this, this problem with either age-related uh, kidney disease or age-related hypertension, because the hypertension is going to impact the kidney disease. Arteriosclerosis that you get with age, which is, which is showing you the hypertension is going to be, you're going to get the same thing in the kidneys, which really are a big bag of blood vessels, right? That's what nephrons are. They're just blood vessels, capillaries. You're going to get the same nephrosclerosis that you get. So the hypertension and the nephrosclerosis actually mirror each other uh, fairly closely. So, you know, I, I, you can't say 100%. I think you're right. But uh, there's still going to be ways that we can mitigate against that sort of age-related decline that we see. We can't, you know, go live in the wild, but, you know, there, there are lots of other things that we can do to sort of make it better. You know, I, uh, the way I, I think about it sometimes is um, <clears throat> kind of like wrinkles and, and white hair, right? You know, it's, it's certainly you know, smoking will give you more wrinkles or, you know, uh, I don't know, you know, maybe poor diet to some extent, uh, but uh, some of this is inevitable and some of it is certainly modifiable. Um, I don't know if you both would agree. Even the pancreas, I've thought a lot about the same concept with diabetes. You know, there's no way that over time, the pancreas, like just generally over time, if you equalize all insults, I'd imagine that it just generally makes less insulin. You know, um, you know, over a general basis, and same with muscles, right? We know that pretty consistently over time, muscles get less strong. Uh, obviously, you can train and change it, and to some extent, but there's some barrier that I suspect slightly declines year over year. But that's like the minutia, right? The biggest is the insults to these things, right? Um, which you guys have talked about so nicely, Dr. Fung. I know you have to leave. Thank you so yeah. much for joining us. Thanks, Jason. Um, Thank you. Great to meet you, Doug. All right. Good to see you, too. Ken. All right. Have a good one. You too. Bye. All right. Bye. So now we can, uh, we can go into your story, Dr. Doug. I'm, I'm, we've talked about this in the group coaching call, but I, I can't wait to get this out to the Low Carb MD listeners. Um, so here you are. You know, we talked about this briefly in, in the introduction. You're a practicing physician, 35 years, and at the end of this, you know, you kind of look back and, and you weren't happy with the state you were left in, you know? Um, so what was going on in that time, you know, with your, you know, you mentioned you retired. Um, what was going on in that time and how did you, you know, come to see the light, so to speak, and put your health first? You know, how did that all happen? How did that transition happen? Um, well, I would say that as I, uh, you know, ended my, my practice career, you know, I, I loved my patients. I mean, it was really hard to quit in a sense because, you know, my patients loved me. I love taking care of them. You know, I, I lived in a, I, I mean, I lived in Spokane, but the, the practice I was in was a large multi-specialty practice, multiple satellites. We had about 400 providers. And my office was in uh, a town of about 5,000, 16 miles west of Spokane called Medical Lake. And it's where Fairchild Air Force Base is. So there's a lot of retired military. Uh, and uh, so I had a great practice. You know, I did OB for quite a while. Um, I took, uh, you know, I had families where I was taking care of four generations. 
Um, one family, I delivered four of their babies. Um, so it was really a fantastic practice, but I was constantly frustrated that I really didn't feel like I could help people as much as I wanted to. Okay, take for instance, the diabetics. So about, it might be as long as 20 years ago, uh, the Washington State Department of Health do, uh, had something called the Diabetes Collaborative. And uh, my, my, my practice, my satellite office and one other in our system uh, joined about 10 others across the state. And uh, we had meetings and we were trying to figure out, you know, how to take care of diabetics in a better way. So we developed a disease registry. Uh, we had them come in every three months. We'd do labs before they came in. If they didn't come in, we would call them. So we tracked them pretty closely. And, uh, you know, uh, I did pretty good with diabetics, but uh, I just kept giving them more and more medicine. I just hammered them. You know, they'd come in, their blood sugar was going up. I'd add another medicine, you know. So I could control them, but I wasn't stopping the complications. And, uh, you know, now, I mean, good night. I think about what I could have done to people if I'd known what I know, you know, what I know now. And there were a number of things that happened uh, in terms of uh, practice, which, you know, we could go into. I got some great examples of how the system of medicine is just broken. It just doesn't work, you know. We didn't have enough time with people. It was money driven. Um, and, uh, you know, finally, um, the, the straw that broke the camel's back was when they uh, were going to take away my scribe. And, uh, you know, I said, that's it. I'm done. So um, <laughs> I know that. I know that I, all too if, well. You know? If I had known about direct primary care and had some way of, of accessing that, I might still be in practice. There's never, there's never too late. We could take you out of retirement if you want. <laughs> we'll put you to work, Dr. Doug. Don't worry about that. You know, we'll put you to work. We got, we got, we'll take care of all that. You know, I want to talk about that a little bit because I don't think people understand the pressures on doctors. Um, a lot of times, you know, I disparage doctors. And maybe not disparage is the right word, but you know, our profession uh, is somewhat... Um, I don't know, uh, you know, just like any other profession, it can, there can be people who are complete charlatans and, you know, you know, uh, tell people outright terrible things. And, you know, and then there can be people who are so rigid in the guidelines and stick to evidence that they may not be inclusive. Um, you know, I remember when I, when I bit worked for Hackensack, which is now Hackensack Meridian, the biggest hospital network in the New York tri-state area, you know, I had seven managers. I had one, you know, scheduling manager, operation manager, a met, you know, a practice manager, CFO. I had a purchasing manager. Um, I couldn't even get Microsoft Office on my computer without seven signatures. Right, that's what it took. Yep. And not only did it was it that I mean, it was a little bit more dark than that. I mean, they were examining where I was referring patients you know, which physical therapy offices, why didn't you refer people to our physical therapy office and not, you know, why didn't you send people to our hospitals and not the neighboring hospital? Um, and, you know, how many widgets have you produced this month? It was, there was a lot of pressure on me to conform to things that, you know, really these people had no business, you know, uh, getting involved with. And, you know, that's just one side. That's just the management side. You know, forget about the insurance companies trying to get somebody an MRI that they need, trying to get, you know, trying to do things, uh, uh, you know, spend more time with patients and getting reimbursed for that. I mean, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I don't think our listeners know what it's like to be a practicing doctor in a big hospital system like that. Yeah, and it's not, you know, I think people... Uh, you know, need to realize that, you know, doctors uh, don't not care and they're not jerks. Uh, they're just people that are, you know, basically trying to help people and stuck in a system that is broken and just won't work. Uh, I'll, I'll give you two, uh, two examples uh, out of my practice. So, um, so I had this patient come in one to us, a 17 year old uh, kid. He had horrible asthma and I've been treating him for quite a while. He's on multiple inhalers. And he had Medicaid, he had welfare, 
And uh, in the state of Washington, as I think it's true in most states, uh, some of the, the plan sometimes was managed by the state, but a lot of times they would farm the plan out to various insurance companies. And then they would give the, the insurance company the money and then let the, the insurance company manage the Medicaid as they, as they saw fit. And what would, what would happen in Washington was that periodically uh, they would switch the patient to a different uh, insurance. So they still had Medicaid, but now instead of uh, being controlled by company X, it was controlled by company Y. They would send patients notification, but patients just didn't get it. You know, they'd get a new card and they just thought they got a new card. And usually what would happen is they'd come into the office and we'd find out, oh, you got different insurance now. And they say, no, we don't. And they go, well, yes, you do. And some of the time, uh, we took some of those plans, but not others. And so we would have patients show up and we couldn't see them. And they couldn't change till the next month came around. And so if it was an emergency, I just say, hey, we'll see them, you know, and, you know, we're just not going to get paid for it. Um, so anyway, so this kid uh, came in and he needed refills and uh, he had changed to a different Medicare Medicaid plan, and they had different rules about asthma medicine. And I could not get him his inhalers. I, I mean, and so I, you know, in this particular instance, I just went ape. You know, I just said, I'm going to, I'm going to get this kid his medicine. It's just ridiculous. So I ended up spending uh, two to three hours on the phone. I had to cancel patients, reschedule them. And, you know, first I dealt with the pharmacy, then the insurance company, pharmacy, people who didn't know anything about medicine, but could only read their computer screen and tell me, no, you can't take that. You can't use that medicine until he's failed this medicine. And I go, no, he's beyond that. He's already, you know, way beyond that. He needs these medicines. And he has been on these medicines and been doing well. And then the pharmacist, you know, and then uh, you know, still couldn't get anywhere. So then I talked to the medical director of the insurance company and didn't get anywhere. And so I said, okay, I'm going, at, I'm going to the, I'm going to the state. And so I called Olympia and eventually ended up talking to the head of Medicaid uh, for the state of Washington and uh, explained everything and he said, I'll fix it. And so a half hour later, I got a call from the uh, local pharmacy saying the medicine had been approved. So, I mean, that's just one example, one patient. But, you know, I could have five or six patients in a day with a very similar story. But, you know, I didn't have the time. Um, and a lot of time the nurses couldn't do it because they didn't know what to tell uh, you know, the people we were talking to, to get it, to get it done. Um, so that was just uh, one, you know, one example of how frustrating it was to, uh, you know, deal with the system. Yeah, I think and then, and then one, one other uh, example was, uh, and th this is kind of interesting. So, you know, every year we'd have a, a review by the medical director of our, our clinic. And, you know, so they would go over everything. And one of the things that they tracked was how many generic prescriptions we wrote, okay? And the reason they did that was because one of the big insurers, which I will not name in, uh, in, in Eastern Washington, uh, you know, they approached our, you know, our administration and they said, look, you know, we're trying to save money on medications. If you can get all your docs as a whole, to prescribe 80% generics, we will rebate you $1 million at the end of the year from the insurance company. And so I'd go have a review and they'd say, well, Dr. Gwynn, your generic prescription rate is only 72%. How come you're not prescribing more generics? And I go, well, I like generics when I can use them, but I'm going to give the my patients, the drug I feel is going to work best. And if that's not a generic, I'm going to give them a brand new drug. And uh, so I just got, you know, really? I mean, yeah. we're, that's total manipulation. 
them yep. trying to force me to prescribe generic drugs because we were going to get a million dollars from the insurance company. Well, you know, At we had one insurance company. Yeah, we had uh, um, Ms. Saban uh, on uh, last week who, oh my God, why am I uh, blanking on her book? It was such a great book. Bottle of Lies. Yeah, The Bottle of Lies. So, you know, like we all like the idea of giving people cheaper medications, $4 pills. But after uh, reading Catherine Nabon's uh, book, Bottle of Lies, I mean, it just makes us, it's, it's tough for us. It's tough for us to, to give somebody on, you know, with, uh, you know, stage four heart failure or an organ transplant um, or who has very, you know, uh, 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 particular kind of thyroid issues, right? I, it's tough for me to just, you know, without even thinking about it, give a generic. And, you know, it, especially after what she's written, you know, we have to take caution. And But this is the thing, I think what you're pointing out so well is there are these people who see the financial benefit, right? And yeah, absolutely. It kind of makes sense. It's like, why not prescribe? You know, you can make a million dollars for your hospital system and you can make, you know, you can give patients cheaper medication. Like it sounds like it's a win, 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 but it's never, it's never that simple. And the worst part about it is they're coercing you, you know, they're coercing you for, you know, based on financial interest. Right. And that's the worst part. And, and that's what I hated. Why are they telling me, you know, my patient's having a heart attack and you want me to send my patient to a hospital that doesn't have a cardiac catheterization. Meanwhile, two miles down the street is a competing hospital system that has a cath lab, you know, where they can right. potentially do something about it. These are the type of things that my director came to me with. And, and it wasn't even the director. It was like the, the CFO, you know, some guy with a bachelor's degree and, you know, mom and dad put him in a powerful place. So um, the issue with, with, this is that people don't understand the pressures on us. And then they ask us why our health is deteriorating. You know, like you, you know, Dr. Doug, I was a 350 pound doctor, you know? I mean, I, I'm sure my you know, renal function would have been worse than yours. You know, if you put me through 35 years of that, you know, I don't think I would have been half as strong as you were. Um, and what made you say enough is enough? What was like the final straw for you? So, uh about three years before I retired, they uh, basically uh, uh, put us on a quota system, okay? So we had to see X number of patients. Now, it wasn't quite that blatant. It was a little more subtle. But uh, people probably don't know this, but it is known how much money every physician in the United States, every specialty makes. It's also known how much money or, uh, or revenue you generate for your company or hospital system. And so what our, uh, what our clinic said was, okay, uh, you have to produce at the, at the mean, the 50th percentile for your specialty. So, uh, so since I was a family physician, I had to produce uh, the average amount that a family physician in the United States produces. And if I didn't, I could be fired. And they wrote that into our contract. So basically, as a primary care doc, the only way that you can make more money is see more patients or improve your coding, uh, you know, which allows you to charge more for the same amount of work. Uh, and so, uh, so and that's like another language. And, People don't understand right. that. Coding is like, you know, th so on top of the medical knowledge that they give us, then they want us to know all of these codes and how to describe our diagnoses in codes and uh, how to, you know, uh, code things so that we get paid appropriately. But it's like a whole nother language and a level of complexity. I mean, I don't know. They teach you coding. They never taught it to me. I had to learn it. Yeah. No, so, we just had to pick it up. And so for people that aren't medical, uh, so uh, taking a history of, a, uh, so a person comes in and they have a problem. So you take their medical history. And if you have a certain number of components to that history, which are mandated, then you can charge more for the visit. 
And, uh, and at some points it gets ridiculous because if someone came in with a cold, you could manipulate the system so that instead of you know, spending five minutes with the patient, you could spend more time. And if you did the coding right, you could code for a bunch of money, even though the visit was basically simple. So anyway, so one of the things that uh, I decided to do was to try and get a scribe. So a scribe, for people that may not know what it is, a scribe is someone who goes in with the physician or the pra or the a mid level PA or nurse practitioner and does the computer, you deal with the patient and they enter it all on the computer. And patients loved it because they felt like they got their doctor back. So they were actually, you could actually look at them rather than looking at your screen. And you could actually spend less time with the patient and they felt like you were spending more time because you were actually engaged with them. And so uh, we had some primary care docs in our system that wanted to do this. And so they said, okay, well, let's do a little trial and see if it's cost effective. And they found out that if you saw five more patients a day with a scribe, which was easy, you could uh, basically pay for the cost of the scribe. And so, uh, so I started angling to get a, a, a scribe and uh, initially they denied it. And the reason they denied it was they said, Dr. Gwynn, we do not want to reward non-productivity and inefficiency because <laughs> you are only seeing 48%, you are only generating 48% of the revenue. And uh, I said, it's not a matter of reward. It's a matter of making me more effective and being able to generate more income for you since money is so important to you. So eventually I, uh, I was able to get a scribe and it was fantastic. And I actually saw 33% more patients a day uh, with a scribe. And then we got bought by a new hospital system and they had a new chief financial officer. And he looked at the other guy's stuff and he said, no, that's ridiculous. You guys are costing us a lot of money. And so they changed the rules and they said, now you are going to have to pay for your scribe. And in my case, it was $45,000 a year to have a scribe, which made me more efficient, a better doctor, generated more income for the system. And the patients loved it and it had been free. And now I was going to have to pay $45,000. And so I said, I'm out of here. That's you know it. What, you know what the worst part is, is that each primary care doctor that works for a hospital generates on average $1 million for that system through labs, imaging, and orders. I mean, that's the sad part is that, you know, uh, they don't, they, <laughs> each doctor these hospitals take over, they're thinking about it financially. Each one primary care doctor they get, they're getting a million dollars in admissions, labs, imaging. And the sad thing is, is that they view the doctors mainly as widgets, right? You know, you just got to produce, you have to produce a certain amount. And um, I can't imagine that kind of environment, you know, that kind of environment where one, you're marginalized, two, you, you have no, uh, I, well, no, I, I can't, I can't imagine it. I had to escape it. You know, but I, I, I can imagine if I had to do that for year over year, I would, it would lead me to poor health. The stress alone would probably lead me to poor health. So, I mean, so they took away the scribe and then what, I mean, what I, so you, you quit, what, what, what happens next? And then how do you transition to, wait a second, I got to take better care of myself. How did that all happen? So, um, uh, so anyway, I, when they, they had the meeting and they dropped the, the final bomb on me, you know, and I'd already talked to my wife about it. Um, and uh, she said, well, she said, do, it, do what you feel like you need to do. And so, uh, the, uh, so the medical director and, uh, you know, some other administrative people, office manager, my partner, my nurse practitioner. So we were all there. And uh, they were presenting this, and, and after about 20 minutes, the office manager turned to me and said, uh, Dr. Gwynn, you haven't said anything. It looks like you have something to say. 
And so I said, <laughs> so I stood up and said, yeah, yeah, I quit, you know. And so I ended up by contract, I had to give him three months notice. And my office was so upset uh, that I ended up uh, agreeing to stay for six, uh, six more months. And, uh, and that I, uh, and that I left. And, uh, you know, it was both a sad day, but also I was, you know, I was jubilant because I got my life back. You know, I was working, you know, evenings trying to, you know, get the medical record done. I worked weekends, you know, I just worked all the time and felt like I really didn't have a life. And my family was so excited when I quit and literally for, for months after I retired, I would wake up in the morning and just be ecstatic. I'd almost start laughing because I just had my life back. I could just do what I wanted to do, you know? <laughs> it was just, it was incredible. And it was about a year and a half, uh, so not that long ago, that I stopped dreaming about medicine and no, medical people disasters. don't know that I still dream about, I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm like, did I forget? What can I do for this patient? Did I, you know, I've had dreams of, I can't, you know, it's so funny you say that. And I don't think people understand like you're, when pe patients trust you with their care, you know, it's not just a doctor's visit. You go home with all that thinking, what can I do more? What can I do better? Did I miss something? You know, um, holy crap, you're the first person I've ever talked to who's talked about dreaming about patients, you know? Um, and situations too, like, uh, you know, I'm getting sued or, uh, you know, the state coming after me because they thought I didn't prescribe, I inappropriately prescribed a narcotic or, I mean, all sorts of just scenarios that I would wake up almost in a panic, you know, uh, having these things happen to me. So, Maybe, Tro, we could uh, talk just a few minutes. So anyway, so what happened was I retired. And then about a few weeks after that, I was talking to our priest, who was a good friend, not my patient. And uh, I knew that he had become a diabetic. And so I asked him how his diabetes was going. And he said, I've reversed it. And I go, no, you haven't reversed it. He says, I did. And I said, well, what'd you do? And so he started telling me about the ketogenic diet, which I had heard about, but just thought was a bad diet. I couldn't have told you anything about it. And so I started looking into it and getting resources, and, you know, reading and, and watching videos and everything. And it was like, wow, this makes complete sense. This, the physiology was, you know, straightforward. And it's like, how come I don't know about this? I've been a doctor for 35 years and I do not know about this. And uh, so anyway, I thought, what do these people eat anyway? You know, I mean, it just sound like, sounded so restrictive. So anyway, eventually I started it and uh, I did very, uh, very well and uh, started to lose weight. And, uh, you know, then we, uh, you know, we moved, uh, you know, I was remodeling a house. I was helping my kids with their houses and so you know life got busy and so I kind of got away from it and then uh early in 2019 I decided I was uh you know I wasn't feeling as well as I had so I got back on it and uh so and I was doing very well and then uh you know I had this you know back and neck pain from arthritis and uh, it wasn't getting better and i you know, found out about the carnivore diet. And I thought, well, what do those guys eat? You know, I thought you couldn't eat much on keto. Now, what do these, you know, they don't eat meat, what? And, uh, but I kept hearing about people who had done well on keto, but they hadn't gotten quite to where they wanted to go. And so the carnivore diet helped them. So I go, okay, I'm going to try this. And so I decide I'm going to do it for uh, three weeks. No, I'm going to do it for a month. And then just meat, nothing else. And then I'll add back in eggs if I'm doing well. And then I'll add back in dairy if I'm doing well. And if I don't see any difference on carnivore, I'm just going to do keto. Okay. So three weeks into it, my pain was gone. And wow. all of the benefits that I had felt 
uh, from keto were just like magnified. And so basically I'm not, I'm not a strict carnivore. I will occasionally eat a few vegetables, usually like cauliflower. Um, I don't eat, uh, and I, I'm a cheeseaholic. So I will occasionally eat some cheese, but if I eat very much, you know, then I have a pain. So, uh, mostly I'm, I'm carnivore. So the things that I got out of it, so there was basically, uh, eight things, health benefits I got. And then number nine is a whole bunch of little things. So number one, I'd been on antidepressants for 28 years. I could not get off them. I would try and taper them. You know, I tried different ones. It just bugged me that I had to take a, a medicine to be normal, you know, off the antidepressants, mood, excellent. Um, Pre-diabetes uh, resolve, uh, A1C now 5.1. Hypertension from three meds to one med. <clears throat> Chronic kidney disease, <clears throat> stage three resolved. Uh, hyperlipidemia, now great lipids, lipids off statins. Uh, I had some inflammatory markers that were elevated. We could never figure out why. My uh, C-reactive protein was 6.47, should be under three. It's now 0.3, so that all went away. Uh, the pain from arthritis, you know, basically gone. Um, I lost uh, 60 pounds. And then a bunch of little things, you know, daily heartburn gone, tension headaches gone, brain fog gone, low energy gone, hay fever gone, toenail fungus, skin tags, and seborrheic keratoses, which are a little gross on the skin that are benign, gone. Testosterone went from 425 to 633. And uh, so, so your whole life, my story, back. and I'm sticking, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> yeah, your whole, your whole life. It sounds like your whole life was got, you know, back. That's just, that's just amazing, you know. And it's, I think, you know, did you ever think that at any point in your career, you know, you practice for 35 years, that diet would have such a huge impact on anybody's life? Never. If and I never saw it. You know, yeah, it just didn't happen. And don't you, you wonder? Know, I was one of those. I was one of those docs that told people, you know, eat, uh, eat less, do more. <laughs> you know, Even though it doesn't work. <clears throat> you know, and, and, and people uh, ask me, uh, uh, Doctor Doug. You know, we're I'm on the board for, uh, you know, SMHP, the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners, and why we're getting this organization set up. It's because every doctor, med school student, they need an opportunity to be exposed to this. Um, imagine the, uh, you know, what your career would have looked like, you know, um, had you been exposed to, I mean, now you get like, now you, now you know, you know, you see how it's impacted you and the, the power it's had. Um, you know, imagine a career as a healer with that knowledge. Uh, so, you know, I think that it's really important. Um, Dr. Doug, it's always it's been a pleasure. Um, guys, it's been an absolute pleasure. Let's take some quick questions from the audience. Uh, if you have any questions for Dr. Doug, let's ask him now, and, uh, and then maybe we'll, uh, we'll part ways. Um, all right, let me see what we got here. Um, oh, we got a fellow sympathizer, right? Uh, Dr. Martinez, who says that she was also seeing 60... 60 patients a day, just trying to make it overhead, the fatigue, the burnout. She said, you're making her have flashbacks, Dr. Doug. <laughs> so, um, you know, absolutely. So any other questions, guys, from the audience, just feel free to ask it now for Dr. Doug. I'll give about a minute and then we'll be on our way. Dr. Doug, if somebody wants to reach out to you, you know, they want to kind of hear more about your story, chat with you, how would they find you? Uh, I have, I do have a Facebook account. I don't use it a whole lot. Uh, I'm, I'm on Twitter and, uh, so what's your Twitter handle? Twitter. Uh, at med lake. So M E D L K M D because the town I practiced in was medical lake. Got it. Med lake. Okay. Dr. Doug, it's been an absolute pleasure and an absolute, not <laughs> absolute honor. Um, 
and uh, we'll be seeing you at the group meetings. Okay. Thanks All for right. having me. Have a good one.